Well, good evening, everyone. It is great to have you here tonight as we continue our study of the book of Micah. I just want to encourage you as we begin our time tonight to go ahead and to uh, uh, share this video with others, invite them to come and join us as we uh, hear more about God's uh, justice, but also about his grace and his mercy. Let's go ahead and begin our time at the time of prayer tonight, and then we'll get into our text for this evening. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for all the gifts that you give us. And God, we thank you that uh, you have made a way, that you have forgiven us through Jesus Christ. And we pray that as we study the book of Micah tonight, we would, we would be convicted where we need to be convicted, and we'd be encouraged where we need to be encouraged. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. All right, so one last thing before we begin our time tonight, uh, and that is just a reminder to you that if you have any comments or questions or anything that you would like to, to ask me, you can reach out to me uh, by phone, by email, Facebook, uh, text me, and I'll do my best to answer any questions that you have first thing next week. Now, before we get into our text for tonight, it's important for us to do a little bit of a recap. And what we have seen so far, the first five and a half chapters of the book of Micah, or four and a half chapters of the book of Micah, is, uh, uh, is how the people of Israel, Judah and Israel, the northern and southern kingdoms, were going to go into exile, they were going to be punished, and the reason they were, it was going to happen was because of their wickedness and their sin. And their wickedness and their sin was recounted, especially in chapter 2, where we are told about how the people, one, worshipped other gods, but also how they uh, were were coveting and they were oppressing the poor in their midst and they were lying and they were cheating and they were not practicing any, any kind of righteousness whatsoever. And then in chapter 4, God begins to speak about redemption. Yes, the people of Israel will be punished because of their sin, but there will be redemption for them. And chapter 4 through uh, chapter 5 verse 6, which we read last week, really talked about that redemption. And chapter 5 specifically talked about, uh, verses 1 through 6, talked about the Messiah that would come from Bethlehem and Ephrathah, Jesus Christ, and how he would come to redeem and restore all of his people. So that's where we're at so far in the book of Micah. God is going to punish his people for their sin, but he will not forget them. He will love them. He will restore them. And today, as we finish up the book of Micah, we finish chapter 5 and look at chapter 6 and 7 as well, we see that same theme going forth. The end of chapter 5 continues to talk about the grace and mercy of God, and then chapter 6, and a lot of chapter 7, talks once again about the, the sin of the people of Israel. But the, the book ends with God's promise of restoration once again. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and get into our text for tonight. We're going to start at Micah chapter 5, verse 7, and we begin here by reading this. Then the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples, like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, which delay not for a man, nor wait for the children of man. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the nations in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among the flocks of sheep, which when it goes through, treads down and tears in pieces, and there is none to, deli to deliver. Your hand shall be lifted up over your adversaries, and all your enemies shall be cut off. And so here God speaks about the remnant of Israel. He, he's talking about how they will be scattered. The people of Israel will be scattered. They will be conquered, they will be taken into exile, but there will be a remnant. And that remnant of Israel will be in the midst of many peoples, and we see that. There's a diaspora, the people of Israel, uh, Jewish people who were scattered throughout the entire world. But the point here is there will be a remnant of God's people, and God will bring them back. And, and even in, while they're in the midst of these other nations... Well, and they're in the midst of these other nations, they will be like a lion among the beasts of the forest. They will be noble and proud, uh, not, not in an unhealthy, sinful way, but proud in the God that they serve. And God will restore them. Uh, very end of that chapter, verse 9, Your hands shall be lifted up over your adversaries, and all your enemies shall be cut off. Here God promises that a remnant will be there, and God will bring victory for his people over those who oppose them. So, God's promise of restoration is there for his people. Verses 10 through 15 we read, And in that day, declares the Lord, I will cut off your horses from among you and will destroy your chariots. And I will cut off the cities of your land and throw down all your strongholds. And I will cut off sorceries from your, hand, uh, from your hand, and you shall have no more tellers of fortunes. And I will cut off your carved images and your pillars from among you. And you shall bow down no more to the work of your hands. And I will root out your Asherah images from among you and, will des and destroy your cities. And in anger and wrath, I will execute vengeance in the nations that do not obey. So when you read through these verses here, it sounds like a harsh punishment. But this is actually a joyful uh, 
a joyful promise that God is making to his people. When he says, in that day, I will cut off your horses from among you and will destroy your chariots. I will cut off your cities and tear down your strongholds. I will destroy your cities. Uh, this is actually a, a, an amazing promise that God is making here. The day that is being talked about here is the day of the Lord, when God will restore his people, when the Messiah will come and will set up his earthly kingdom. This is a day that is looking well into the future from even now, this moment in time where we are today. This is a day that is looking forward to the last day, when God will restore all things and, and re restore all of his creation and, and will be living in paradise. And the idea here is this. The war chariot will be cut off. There will be no more need for war. So the war chariot will be cut off. Uh, I will cut off your cities out of your hand and throw down all your strongholds. What God is saying here is the walls of your cities will be taken down. The walls of the cities in, this ancient, in the ancient world were built up to protect from invasion and war. The point of this is God will tear down those walls because there will be peace and prosperity in the land. There will be no need to protect from enemies. The sorceries that will be cut off, the carved images, the, the gods, the false gods, they will no longer be present, they will no longer be real, they will no longer be a part of the people of Israel's life because God will be their God, he will be in their midst, and so there won't be any false gods, there won't need to be any sorceries because the divine will be right there. And so God is saying all these things, all these things of war and of, of oppression and all these things of of searching for God in, in ways that are unhealthy and that are false and that have led you astray, all those things will be wiped out. Because I will deliver you from your captivity, and I will make you into a new nation, a new creation, and you'll be in paradise with me. And then verse 15, And in anger and wrath I will execute vengeance on the nations that cannot obey. And, and here God is saying he'll bring punishment among all the nations who rebel against God. And, and, and I think we're looking at this through the lens of the New Testament, what we see here is this is a promise from God to all those who believe in him. All those who are part of his people now. They will have that day when Christ returns where there will be no more war or anger or, or, or any problems whatsoever. For those who do not know God, they will be cut off. So this is actually, I think, a very encouraging chapter, for chapter 4 and 5, both very encouraging chapters for for, for those who, uh, for those of us who are the people of God. But now as we turn to chapter 6, uh, there's a transition here. And, and, you know, chapters 4 and 5, Micah is speaking to something in the, in the distant future. Now chapter 6, he begins to speak to the people of Israel again in the moment where they're at. And God once again raises up an accusation against his people about where they are in their sin. So, so what we see in the first three chapters is God's accusation against his people for their wickedness. Uh, God's promise of a future restoration and, uh, uh, and, and life and hope for his people in chapters 4 and 5. And then in chapter 6, a transition back now to God speaking to his people and saying, but now, right now in this moment, you are not living as my children. And I have a problem with that. And so that's what we're going to get to now in chapter 6. So here's, a, here's another big transition away from the, the future promise of the remnant and the restoration to now the indictment of God upon his own people. So chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, we read this. Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear you, mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. The Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I, <coughs> how have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised? And what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him? And what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord? So here now... Like I said, Mike is directing his prophecy away from, from the future in chapters 4 and 5 and is now back to the present time in which he's speaking to the people of God. And that's, you know, God is speaking here as well. It's important for us to understand this. Mike is speaking God's words. Hear what the Lord says. Arise and plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. So God is, is bringing his creation as the jury against his own people. Hear you mountains the indictment of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth. The Lord has indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. 
So God is about to charge his people uh, with the failure to do what was required of them. And in and, and verse 8, which we're going to look at in a minute, uh, that's where God really says what was required of the people that they were failing to do. But God's indictment against his people is that they have failed to follow him. But then it's interesting, in verse 3, he talks. He has this uh, ironic rhetorical question of, of uh, when he says, Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. Where God, God looks at this and almost says, What did I do wrong? And I love this, actually, because here you, you, you see, I mean, God is, God is not, uh, we, we can sometimes uh, anthropomorph, uh, I'm messing up the word, but humanize God in a way that's unhealthy. God is not... A human. We are made in his image. He is greater and higher than us uh, in ways that we cannot even understand or comprehend. However, we are made in God's image. And so there are things uh, in our human life that, uh, uh, that, that show us a glimmer of who God is because we are made in his image. And I think this is a moment where this happens. I mean, think about when your kids make mistakes in your lives. I mean, yes, you blame them for the mis- in their lives. You blame them for the mistakes they've made. But you also then begin to question, well, what did I do wrong? And that's almost what we see God doing here. I mean, it's, it's a ironic that God, as he accuses his people, says, what, what did I do wrong? And then he tells his people, didn't, didn't I provide for you? Didn't I rescue you? Didn't I save you? What, what, what more could I have done for you? Verses 4 and 5 is when he talks about that. And he gives four examples Four specific examples of a saving acts. First, he says, uh, For I brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. What have I done to grieve you and to weary you? I rescued you from slavery. And then after I rescued you from slavery, what happened? I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. After I rescued you from slavery, I sent you good leaders, excellent leaders. When people remember when Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. If you're not familiar with the story, it's found in Numbers chapter 22 verses 20, uh, Numbers chapters 22 through 24. But here, basically, this king Balak had a a, a a a diviner Balaam come to curse the people of Israel. But God wouldn't allow him to curse the people of Israel. He would only allow him to bless the people of Israel. It's an amazing story. I'd encourage you to read it. But but there, God is saying, you know, I delivered you from slavery, I gave you good leaders, and I protected you. I guarded you. People were wanting to curse you, wipe you out, destroy you, but I protected you. I guarded you. And then finally, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. Finally, God talks about how he led them into the promised land. Shittim and Gilgal are, are two cities that are opposite one another on the on the banks of the Jordan River. One's on the east side, one's on the west side. And when God brought Israel into the promised land, he parted the Jordan River between those two cities and they walked through into the promised land. And so what God is saying is, you know, I have a charge against you. And is it my fault that you have wandered away from me? I mean, I I delivered you from slavery. I gave you good leaders. I guarded and protected you. I brought you into the promised land. And yet despite all this, you're choosing to ignore me. You're choosing to fail to t- what I've called you to do. In essence, what God is saying here is, you can blame me for this all you want, but the truth of the matter is, you have made a decision to wander away from me. But then, <coughs> verse 6 through 8, we finally see what it is the people have failed to do. God says, "With what shall I come before the Lord? And bow myself and uh, bow myself before God on high. Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings, with a calf, uh, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oils? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my, <laughs> my excuse me, <laughs> of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? So what we see here is. Uh, Micah gives, uh, God is speaking through the prophet Micah, and he says, uh, uh, what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? In other words, he's saying, what, what should the people of God bring to God what, to, to, to make him turn and relent from his fierce anger? What should the people do? And he gives these escalating examples of what it could be. Should we bring a, 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 a what is it, a, sh- a sheep 
A calf who's a year old, that was actually a recommended sacrifice in Leviticus chapter 9. Should we bring one of the sacrifices that God asked us to bring in, the, in his Levitical law? Well, maybe that's not good enough. So should we bring a thousand rams? A thousand rams to sacrifice before God, and then God will turn his anger from us. Well, maybe that won't do, but we can bring rivers of oil to sacrifice to God. Then maybe God will turn his anger from us. And then he escalates it to an absurd level when he says, Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? <laughs> maybe the, 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 the calf won't work, or the thousand rams won't work, or the rivers of oil won't work. So I'll bring, I'll sacrifice my own son on the altar. But none of those things are what God desires. Yes, God commands and sacrifices in the Old Testament, but that's not what God truly desires. What God desires is found in verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. What God wants is a humble and a contrite spirit and somebody who follows him and loves him. That's what God wants. All these other sacrifices really don't mean anything if they're empty. God's saying he wants your heart here. But it's interesting also, uh, you know, some of the things that God, that how it speaks directly to the sins of the people of Israel at the time. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice? What was one of the biggest accusations that God had against the people of Israel is that they were not doing justice. They were, they were doing unjust judgments. <coughs> to and to walk into uh, what was the uh, next thing, and to love kindness. And uh, uh, that was to kind of have the love of God, to have that loyal, steadfast love that God had. And then finally, to walk humbly with your God, to be modest and reverential, always conscious of one's dependence upon the Lord. That's what God wanted. He didn't want sacrifices, God wanted his people to walk humbly before him doing justice, doing good, having humble and contrite hearts. But that's not going to happen. In verses 9 through 16, talk about the destruction of the wicked of Israel. God says, The voice of the Lord cries to the city, and it, is, and it is sound wisdom to fear your name. Hear of the rod and of him who appointed it. So here, this introduces this, this next part. God cries out against the people of Israel. He's going to describe the sin that they're going to commit, that they have been committing in verses 10 through 12. And, uh, um, and, and here, you know, God says, Hear of the rod and of him who appointed it. Uh, the rod is, 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 God is, Micah is reminding the people of what the Lord required in verse 8, to do good, to walk humbly before God, to, to execute justice. And uh, now they will hear from the Lord how the rod of his punishment will fall on them because they failed to do this stuff. So verses 10 through 12 talks about that sin. It says, Can I forget any longer the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked and the scant measure that is accursed? <coughs> Shall I equip the man with wicked scales and with a bag of deceitful weights? Your rich men are full of violence, your inhabitants speak lies, and their tongues, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. So here God is saying the rod of God is going to come upon you. The rod of discipline is going to come upon you because the treasures of wickedness that you have stored for yourself, the wealth of the people of Israel was largely built upon uh, land possessions that were gained by unjust practices. We've already talked about that in, in past weeks. But how they had misused the mistreated and misjudged the poor in their midst. How they had uh, uh, used false scales, which is talked about in verse 11, to, to steal from people. And, uh, uh, and how they were full of lies and deceit. The only thing that mattered to the wealthy <coughs> in that time was accumulating more wealth. And I said this a few weeks ago, but it's worth repeating. Wealth in and of itself is not the issue. The issue here for the people of Israel is that wealth has become their God and that the only thing that matters is getting more and more and more. If they have to stomp all over other people to get it, that's what they're going to do. And that's what God is speaking out against here. That's why the rod of God's discipline is going to come down upon the people of Israel because they have loved wealth more than anything. And in that wealth, they have acted unjustly and they have oppressed the poor in their midst and they have rejected God and made their wealth their God. 
And that, that does speak to us today. We should not love the wealth that we have, whether it's a lot or little. Wealth is not a bad thing in and of itself. Money is not a bad thing in and of itself. But our relationship with it, it can be the problem. And if the only thing that matters in your life is getting more, 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 and more, then you have a problem. And we need to turn from that. Verses 13 through 16 we read, Therefore I strike you with a grievous blow, making you desolate because of your sins. You shall eat, but not be satisfied, and there shall be hunger within you. You shall put away, but not preserve, and what you preserve I will give to the sword. You shall sow, but not reap. You shall tread olives, but not anoint yourselves with oil. You shall tread grapes, but not drink wine. For you have kept the statutes, statutes of Omri and all the works of the house of Ahab, and you have walked in the, their counsels, that I, make you, that I may make you a desolation and your inhabitants a hissing. So you shall bear the scorn of my people. <clears throat> so God speaks very clearly here because of the sin of the people of Israel, because of their rejection of God and making their wealth their money, uh, their wealth their idols, uh, God will strike them a grievous blow. They shall eat and not be satisfied. They shall try to preserve, but there will not be anything kept. They will sow, but not reap. And they'll tread olives, but not, not anoint yourselves with oil. Uh, so they will work hard, but reap none of the benefits of that. They will be taken into exile and made, uh, basically made into slaves, which it did happen in, uh, in 586 B.C. when the, the people of Judah were taken into exile to Babylon. Of course, 70 years later, God re returned them to Israel, but, uh, uh, but they would actually face this. And, uh, uh, and the reason why, once again, verse 15, for you have kept the uh, statutes of Omri and all the works of the house of Ahab, and you've walked in their counsels. Uh, Omri and Ahab were a father uh, and a son who ended up both being kings of Israel, and they were the two most wicked kings uh, of the Israelites at any point. And uh, they, they followed other gods, and they uh, rejected the law of God, and instead of following God the way they should, the people of Israel had walked in the ways of these wicked kings. Because of that, they were going to face this punishment. <coughs> so that concludes chapter 6. Uh, we are going to go ahead and finish up tonight. We're going to look at chapter 7 and 9 too. This is the last chapter of the book of Micah. And so uh, this chapter... Uh, you know, speaks to the people and, and tells them to wait on the God of salvation and finally concludes with God's promise of restoration. So let's go ahead and get into chapter 7. So Micah starts off and says, Woe is me, for I become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the grapes have been gleaned, there is no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig that my soul desires. So this is actually Micah per, uh, lamenting here. Woe is me, for there is nothing left. Uh, the idea here is there's just, uh, just as one finds nothing to eat after the harvest is completed. So Micah, here, he's searching uh, in vain for any righteous people in the land, and he's finding none of them. So woe is me, woe is the people of Israel, for there is no righteousness in the land, essentially is what that is saying. Verses 2 and 3 we read, The godly has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among mankind. <coughs> they all lie in wait for blood, and each hunts the other with a net. Their hands are on what is evil, to do it well. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe, and the great man utters the evil desire of his soul. Thus they weave it together. And so we see Micah at a point where he's feeling completely hopeless. The godly have perished from the earth. There is no one who does good. Now clearly that was not true. There were some who did good. But the general idea here is, is that society as a whole in Israel had... had uh, fallen away completely from doing any righteous or good thing. And and even the leaders are, are the leaders are not even the leaders, the leaders are the worst. Uh, their hands are on what is evil to do well, and a prince and the judge ask for a bribe. The great man unders the evil desires of his soul. Uh, so the leaders who are supposed to be setting an example for the people of Israel, uh, they, they are not doing it. And they weave together like a spider a wicked device that traps the weak and the, un uh, and the unwitting in, in their nets of deceit. That's how bad it was at that time. Verses 4 through 6 we read, The best of them is like a briar, the most upright of them <coughs> a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman, of your punishment, has come. Now their confusion is at hand. Put no trust in a neighbor, have no confidence in a friend. 
guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. For the son treats the father with contempt, the daughter rises up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies are the men of his own house. So here God is saying, you know, the very best of you, the best of them are like a briar, the most upright of them a thorn hedge. So the idea here is even the best and most upright of the people of Israel were, were plants that produced no fruit and that they tangled people up in their webs. And, uh, uh, and, and because of that, no one could trust anyone. You couldn't trust your son. You couldn't trust your daughter. So verses 4 and 5 are saying there is no trust, no hope, even amidst the family, because there's so much deception in the land. This is the state of Israel. We have to understand, this is the state of Israel in the time of Micah. Okay? This is not just something that will happen. This was the state of Israel in the time of Micah. You couldn't even trust your family, because they were constantly seeking wealth and prosperity over following God. And then verse 7 says, But as for me, I will look to the Lord, I will wait for the God of my salvation, and my God will hear me. And this is great, because as bad as the sinful conditions were in the land, Micah continued to trust in the Lord's salvation. And this is important for us to understand, too. Sometimes we may feel like we're living in a, in a day in a place that's very similar to this, where there's godlessness all over the place, where there's uh, the wrong priorities in place, where we're seeking after all kinds of things that are not of God. And I, I think we are living in a society that is like that. But what does Micah do in the midst of that? He cries out to God and says, I will wait on you, I will fear you, I will trust in you. And that's, that's what we need to be doing as the people of God. No matter what is going on in the world around us, trust in God, fear Him, follow Him, and wait on His salvation. Verses 8 through 10 we read, Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I'll bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against Him until He pleads my cause and executes judgment for me. He will bring me out to the light, and I shall look upon the vindication, his vindication. Then my enemy will see, and shame will cover her who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will look upon her. Now she will be trampled down like the mire of the streets. And so here, verse 8, we see a transition. Now, when, when Micah says, Rejoice not over me, O my enemy, he's not speaking for himself. Now he's speaking for the remnant of Israel. So, so the day will come. So this is important. We have been talking about something that was happening in that moment. This was the, the culture and the day, verses 1 through 7, that the people of Israel were living in. Beginning in verse 8 now, it's a transition to the future. When the people of Israel will be in exile, they will be dispersed, they will recognize their sin, and they will cry out to God in repentance. When I rise, I shall fall. Uh, and we see that Israel certainly did fall. But the remnant would rise, and God would bring salvation to all of the earth through that remnant. The Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my cause. The people of Israel will recognize their sin. They will repent. And part of that repentance is an acceptance of the consequences and the willingness to bear the punishment of one's sins. And so the people will acknowledge their sin. And as they acknowledge their sin, they will not plead for themselves, but they will turn to God to plead for them, because they know that they serve a God who is gracious and merciful. And he will bring me out to the light, and I shall look upon his vindication. And then verse 10 talks about how shame will come upon all those who mocked Israel for putting their hope in the Lord. And so what we can learn from this, this is something we can learn from as well. When we do sin, once we become aware of that sin, we need to cry out to God for forgiveness. For he is gracious and merciful to forgive us and have him plead our cause for us. I mean, Jesus died for us and he is pleading our cause for us in heaven. That's what Micah is speaking up to here, uh, the people of Israel, but that's what we can learn in our own lives today as well. Verses 11 through 13, we read, A day for the building of your walls, and that day the boundary shall be far extended. And that day they will come to you from Assyria and the cities of Egypt, and from Egypt to the river, from sea to sea, and from mountain to mountain. The earth will be desolate because of its inhabitants and the fruit of their deeds. And so what God is saying here is that he's now looking once again well in the future. And it's the day of the Messiah, when Jesus Christ returns to this earth. And, and what we're seeing here in verse uh, uh, verse. 11 is a day for the building of your walls, and that day the boundary shall be extended. Uh, and that day, when Jesus returns, the kingdom of God will expand. 
that will include not just the people of Israel, but it will include all people who put their hope and their trust in Jesus Christ, Jews and Gentiles. And so the kingdom of God will expand beyond just the boundaries of Israel, but to all who believe in Jesus Christ. And that day they will come to you, and God will, God will gather his people from everywhere, from Assyria to Egypt, the great river Euphrates. The, the, the point of this is God will gather his people from all over the world, throughout all times and in all places, into his kingdom. But then verse 13, but the earth will be desolate because of its inhabitants for the fruit of their deeds. So, but the earth, those who are not a part of God's people, through Jesus Christ, will be left desolate and be destroyed. In verses 14 through 17 we read, Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your inheritance, who dwell alone in a forest, in the midst of a garden land. Let them graze in Bashan and Gilead, as in the days of old, as in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt. I will show them marvelous things. The nations shall see and be ashamed of their, uh, their might. They shall lay their hands on their mouths, and their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent, like the crawling things of the earth. They shall come trembling out of their strongholds. They shall turn in dread to the Lord our God, and they shall be in fear of you. <coughs> and so God once again promises that when Jesus comes, he will bring, restore and bring to life all who put their hope and their trust in him. And there will be rejoicing in life found in Christ Jesus. And for those who are not in Christ Jesus, they'll be ashamed, they'll be amazed, they will be in fear. This is a joyous thing for you and for me. Christ has come. He has restored his people into a right relationship with him. Through his death and his resurrection, he has made us part of his family. And now we will live in peace for all eternity with God because of what Jesus has done for us. And finally, the prophecy of Micah ends of verses 18 through 20. Where we read, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnants of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all your sins in the depths of the sea. He will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham, as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. And so here is the promise of God's forgiveness, God's love, and God's compassion. Nothing we do can separate us from the love of God. When we come to him in repentance, our sins are forgiven, and they are put into the depths of the sea <clears throat> and we receive the faithfulness of God, the faithfulness that he showed to his people, the faithfulness that he continues to show to his people even today. And so that's the book of Micah. In this book, once again, just to recap it all, we see how God speaks out against the sin of selfishness and wickedness and greed and idolatry, but how God promises restoration and forgiveness and life to all who believe in him, for he is steadfast in his love and in his grace and in his mercy. If you have any questions, once again, email me, call me, text me, and I'll do my best to answer those questions first thing next week. Uh, we're going to go ahead and close the prayer, and then next week we'll be going into uh, another book of the Minor Prophets. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you that you show us grace, mercy, and forgiveness every day in our lives, and we pray that we would trust in that and follow you always. Thank you for all your gifts to us, and we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you all so much, and you have a great night.